Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing that uh, with us. The Africa Development Bank has uh, estimated that Sub-Saharan Africa needs some 93 billion uh, US dollars annually over the next 10 years in order to finance uh, uh, infrastructure on uh, the continent. Uh, we know uh, that less than half of that is currently being uh, provided, which gives us a infrastructure finance gap of around $50 billion to, uh, to fill. And when you look at the nature of the infrastructure agenda, whether it's around water, roads, information, communications, technology, uh, electricity, power, is at the heart of, uh, the, uh, of the challenge. And therefore, it's right that in the panel discussion we're now going to have, we should be giving that uh, a particular degree of emphasis. And I'm going to begin by really asking uh, the man uh, responsible uh, within the Ministry of, uh, of Energy uh, responsible for finance and infrastructure, the Honorable uh, Joseph Kodjo. Uh, I'm going to, to ask him how he sees uh, the challenge that Ghana is facing uh, at this time uh, and what measures he proposes to, to take to, uh, uh, to uh, tackle that. Uh, Joseph, you've got uh, an enviable uh, record, a track record in financial analysis and planning when you, uh, with uh, ENO, uh, international. You then uh, went on, uh, before you got into politics, uh, to be in charge of investment for the Cocoa, Cocoa Marketing uh, Board. And of course, you've served in, uh, in Parliament on the Select Committee of Mines and Energy. Uh, you've been vice chairman of the same uh, committee in the past. So you've got a track record of del delivery in this area. How are you going to apply those, those skills to the current challenges? Uh, thank you, and uh, I must say we have thought through the challenges very well. And before winning elections, it would have read in our manifesto that um, the problems of the power sector, the energy sector, is not technical, it's financial. Mm -hmm. And for which reason this government decided to create, uh, contrary to tradition, three deputy ministers for the Ministry of Energy. Um, at first level, in the past, the ministry was divided into ministry, a Ministry of Petroleum and Ministry of Power. That was merged to Ministry of Energy because the challenges there were not, uh, were being put into pockets in isolation. So this time, finance and infrastructure the creation of that deputy ministerial position in itself is the first level solution to say delivery of power consistently, reliably, and cost effectively is not, cannot be done in isolation. We should look at it from fueling challenges, diversifying the sources of fuel, and then making sure that they are fully financed all the time to deliver these diversified sources of fuel to power the installed thermal plants we have. Uh, because the DUMSO, DUMSO, which is power, frequent power outages, it, it's been uh, entered into Wikipedia. It's interesting to read out. <laughs> became, became a characterization of our economy. Okay, so. We diagnosed the problem to be financial. What we had done right is that at any given level, we have technical competence to deal with the problem. So these financial challenges, um, we say all the energy sector debt, which characterized that frequent power outages, the economy went through in the past four years. Uh, we bring in liquidity into the sector so as part of the news today, you would notice that we are, in the next couple of months, going to float energy sector bond to the level up to about 2.5 billion US dollars to bring liquidity to the sector and also make sure that the 
sector participants like the state-owned enterprises, VRA, uh, Gridco, and ECG are all financially restructured to make sure that um, independent power producers who bring their power, power plants and do supplies to the sector are paid on time. So that is the approach we are using from fueling to technical issues and liquidity in the sector so that we won't go back to the period where we have frequent power outages. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. And, and I wonder, um, Pamela, uh, Pamela Duncan Tete, who is at the, on, my far, on my far right, you, your Director of Communications and Outreach at the Millennium Development Authority, so you're in a, in a uh, key uh, position in this uh, particular area in relation to electricity um, uh, uh, generation. Uh, we know that the government has some exciting new plans in that area in terms of uh, bringing in uh, uh, additional uh, capital uh, 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 investment and improving uh, uh, management. Uh, you have an extensive track record yourself in corporate communications. How would you characterize uh, the nature of the challenge in terms of electricity generation uh, and indeed uh, the current government's response to it. Thank you. Um, the Deputy Minister has already dilated extensively on the nexus between uh, economic development and uh, the need for reliable uh, and sufficient electricity distribution. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be um, uh, working very very actively at the Millennium Development Authority where we are implementing the Ghana Power Compact. Now the Ghana Com uh, Power Compact is a bilateral agreement between Ghana and the United States um, in, under, a, under a grant of approximately $500 million to implement certain interventions that should address the constraints um, that we're experiencing or have experienced in the past in unreliable and insufficient electricity supply. Um, the, the, the compact is essentially designed to address these constraints. So there are six projects. Um, the, the, the key one is the ECG financial and operational turnaround project. And uh, I'm sure many have heard of one of the first activities, which is the introducing the private sector participation into ECG. We are currently um, undergoing uh, a process where we are procuring um, a concessionaire to, to, to come in to, to manage, to operate, and to invest uh, in ECG. You see, the problem is not only um, some of the, uh, you know, problems we, we've all heard related to DUMSO. It, it actually does have to do with um, old equipment, the need for modernization, the need uh, for having to look at the governance structure and, and, and make some interventions there as well. And so the interventions that we're undertaking will be looking at that. Uh, we are looking, at, looking for a concessionaire who will invest at least $500 million in the first five years of operating a 20-year concession to turn around um, some of these issues. Areas like outage reduction uh, is key. Modernizing the utility itself, you know, is key. In addition, we will be also, uh, as part of the compact, um, implementing other projects that we believe will address some of these constraints. So, so in sum, you know, we have a very, very um, full program and there are many, many activities that MEDA is undertaking under the compact to address these issues. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that, Pamela, and we look forward to hearing, to hearing more. Um, Dr. Dr. Sapon, uh, Kofi, 
Now, you bring to your current uh, task uh, an enviable uh, track record uh, academically. You did your PhD in industrial and business studies uh, at, uh, at Warwick, and I know they're very proud of you. Uh, from my own friends in that, uh, at, at that university. Uh, you excelled uh, at, the co at the Ghana uh, Cocoa, Cocoa Board. And now you've been given what some might uh, uncharitably describe as a poison chalice, in the sense that uh, you, you are CEO of the Ghana uh, National Petroleum uh, Corporation. Uh, there's one thing that concerns people as much, if not sometimes more, of what happens when they switch on the light is what happens when they turn uh, the, uh, the ignition on their car and when subsequently they have to pay for it and all, all of that. So share with us how you're going to tackle them. Well, I think the, the issue of quality is not really a problem. Um, we have the National Petroleum Authority, which is um, really up to the task trying to implement all international kind of standards. For example, I know that um, the new levels of sulfur required in fuel um, is quite low, and Ghana has to gravitate towards that. In that regard, in terms of importation, the standards are being enforced. Um, with respect to our own refinery, that will require some major retooling of our facilities. Uh, when I worked there nearly a decade ago, of course the sulfur levels were quite high. Now we have to live within, within international levels, which are very, very low. Mm -hmm. The facilities there certainly cannot do the job. And that requires that we have to retool that, we have to refix that. My colleague, um, the former commissioner to this country, Isaac is not here, but I'm quite aware that he's trying to do everything possible to get the right technology in place, and obviously that will require some kind of investments. In terms of distribution, I think Ghana has gone too far, very far. The Government has succeeded in deregulating the pricing mechanism that is making the market, allowing the market to dictate what the pump prices have to be. And that has been quite successful. And I believe that um, there's no turning back in that regard. And that clearly shows the response of private sector when the right kind of environment is uh, provided. There, with a deregulation, a number of importers have come up, uh, freeing government from investing or trading directly in the products. And when it comes to the retail distribution, maybe I'll say Ghana has got too many retailers. Mm -hmm. The oil marketing uh, companies, quite many. You have the oil majors like Shell, Total, in the country, all right, but the indigenous um, oil marketers, quite many, and that has brought competition. And every corner, just around the corner, I believe there, is over, there has been overinvestment. Every corner you see a gas station around. So in terms of the downstream, I believe, midstream, downstream, I believe the policy framework has worked quite well. Maybe to my own arena, is about how to bring the oil from the, from the, from the ground. Um, I can say that for now, um, we're doing roughly, um, since uh, 2010, I mean the first oil was found in uh, uh, 2007, the year 20, uh, 2007, and actual production commenced 2010. Uh, with um, Talo Oil, the operator, and I can say that today, total production in the country is nearly 200,000 um, barrels a day. We have three fields, the Jubilee field, which is um, what uh, uh, Jubilee 
operated first. Now there's the TAIN field. And then recently, ENI Vitor GMPC partnership brought in the Sankofa Jinyame field, where we started uh, production and will be officially commissioned on the 6th of next month by His Excellency the President. In total, we're doing roughly 200,000 barrels. Um, a lot more discoveries have been made. And had it not been the border dispute issue with Cote d'Ivoire, I'm sure Hess Corporation would have by now started production. That, I'm, I'm quite certain, immediately after the ruling in September, whatever the outcome, we will see production in that field. Um, there is also the chance that the ENI field will be bringing to shore about 180 million standard cubic feet of gas per day. That will be used for our power generation, which um, my minister uh, may be elaborating on. But there's great potential for that field to produce up to about 300 million standard cubic feet per day. So there's a great potential in that regard. And that certainly is going to open up the opportunity for us to venture into petrochemicals, which GMPC is positioning itself to do. But more importantly, the onshore basin, which is called the Votean Basin, covering nearly 40% of Ghana land mass, um, seem to have some prospects, good prospects. In the next 18 months, my corporation's attention will be directed at carrying out the necessary surveys, the 2D seismic survey, to see what is there. And that is going to be very exciting. Good. And um, I think that's where I'll end it for now. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed uh, for that. We're about to throw the discussion open to the wider audience, but before I do that, Mr. Hassan, you're, yes, yes. you're here, you're with us. Yes. What's your response to what you've heard and what's your take on this particular subject? I'm actually someone who's been in Ghana for nearly 10 years as an investor. And I guess my, um, the point of my being here is to sort of let all the uh, people on the sidelines who may or may not want to go into Ghana know about some of my experiences. And some have been amazing, and some have not been so amazing. So just a little bit about me. I started a little company called Simba Energy in Liberia in 2007. 2009, I got the first onshore permit in Li uh, Liberia. I then went to build out a small Pan-African oil exploration company. Uh, we applied for a block in the Voltaean Basin in 2010 after doing a lot of work. Um, and since then we have heard, and there's no criticism to anyone here, that they will be doing a survey. We had offered, and this is where I think the government, the new government could maybe make some changes, positive changes. We offered to go in and explore about seven and a half thousand square kilometers where we would pay for the airborne survey, we would pay for the 2D seismic under a production sharing contract. GNPC the whole time has told us to wait, to wait, to wait. We're still waiting. But it hasn't discouraged us. In the in intervening years, Simba has grown. We um, are now listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. We've signed a $250 million investment with a group out of India, Esla Group, who will explore and pay for all of our exploration activities going forward. And we've never been busier. Even though the oil market's down, we've never been busier. And on the oil side, I'd just like to say one thing. The, the uh, senior minister, he said two things. He said, uh, investors will appreciate the new attitude of being in a hurry for investment and growth. And I, I, and I welcome that because I've been in a hurry in Ghana since 2009. And I look for, forward to spending a lot of money there. The other thing I think... Um, you should realize about Ghana is, is Tala Oil, when it went into the Jubilee field, was a fraction of the size it was bef before it went in, and now it's a monster. Tala's growth, which is one of the great uh, Irish-British oil and gas companies, a major portion of it came from their activities in Ghana. 
which I would like to replicate for Simba. And I hope you let me. And don't, don't waste your money flying an airborne. I could probably do it cheaper and better. Okay? But that's, that's a discussion we can have later. So I've raised tens of millions of dollars for uh, in investment in Africa, and I, and I hope to do a lot more. And um, even though things didn't go well, I never left Ghana. As the, uh, in the former discussion, people said, uh, you know, use Ghana as a hub. I've always used Ghana as a, as a hub for West Africa. It's one of the best places to be, to go anywhere in West Africa, and I, and I agree with that. I'll skip through. Why Ghana? Well, you can read that list, and, you know, the Chinese are going to give you $15 billion. That's great. But really, the reason I'm in Ghana is I have made some amazing friends. I met some amazing people. Uh, I have started a couple of small ventures, and the people that were helping me, I've made them all shareholders in, the, in my private ventures in Ghana. And Ghana is full of amazing people. They're great entrepreneurs. They're hungry, and they work hard, and that's why I've never left Ghana. And I hope I can come back in a bigger way. I'll come see you next week. <laughs> no, okay. So it's a, it's a, sta it's a stable country. It, it, it's a kind of a country where you can get uh, international financing. Everyone in the banking business loves Ghana. I had a venture in Central African Republic. It was a terrible response in comparison. People love, love Ghana. So I've started a new, um, I'll just skip through this. I've already done that. Um, so I've started a new company in Africa called NIOTA. Our goal is to uh, address the needs of power, which is not just Ghana, across Africa. Everywhere I go, you stay in a five-star hotel and the power keeps flickering on and off all day. That's a major problem that shouldn't be there because Africa and places like Ghana are extremely rich, and this should not be a problem. So for me, that's a market opportunity. So Power is a big business. You can't do it like I started Simba on my credit card. You need big investors. You need big backers. And I'm not kidding. I really did start that company on my credit card. So I partnered with two groups. One is called Uncle Energy. Uncle Energy, uh, the managing director, Lorena, is here in the audience. You should talk to her. She's an amazing woman. She's been involved with uh, banks in London and financed over $10 billion in renewable projects around the world in her time as banking, and now she has an advisory. I look to her to advise me and also help me raise several hundred million dollars to, to do our project. My other partner is a company you've probably never heard of called Fabtech. They're one of the largest fabricators in the world. It's owned by one man uh, who's a very dear friend of mine. He has 17,000 employees around the world. And we have partnered to go into Africa because he does everything from building oil rigs, jacket rigs, rigs, anything you need fabricated uh, and with design. And he has huge capital. So he's one of my financial technical partners. So we're coming into Ghana with Neota Power to build renewable energy projects. And we're not coming, you know, oh, we'll have to go do this. We, we're coming fully backed. So I'm running out of time here. So currently, we're in Djibouti with Harry, and we're in Kenya applying for geothermal. Uh, why Ghana? Grid challenges, all the things you've heard of today. But Ghana has great sun. Ghana has uh, great laws, very transparent laws. Ghana is fundable, and Ghana needs it. So we have some great ideas. And uh, it's funny, this conference, I wasn't going to be here, but yesterday we opened our new office for NIOTA in Accra. So we have three people there right now. We hope to have about 10 by the end of the year on the technical side, 100% Ghanaians. Uh, my business philosophy is when I go to Africa, the people I work with are usually uh, better academics, more intelligent, better hustlers. So I, I always like to be the dumbest guy in the room. I hire them, and they tell me what to do, and I do it. And that's what we've done in Ghana. So, uh, so this is our, our projects. We're working with... Un on call, and as you can see, I don't need to read it out, uh, the fine print, there's huge, huge potential, and I'm very excited to be here with this new government. I love the attitude. You know, hurry up. I've been hurrying up for nine years. I'm so happy to hear it. It's amazing. You know, maybe I'll make a little money now, and, uh, and I'll skip that. Oops. Sorry. I'll go back. I ruined your machine. But... That's my part of Ghana. Um, I've been invested in Ghana in various ventures privately, 
and now in a very big way. And I've got great partners with OnCall and FabTech, and I hope I have great partners with you, sir. I will see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you heard it here. Let's give them a round of applause. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Hassan, for that, uh, for that plug. Uh, for Nyota, but also for Ghana. And that's always, that's always good, good news. Thanks to the, to the discipline uh, of, uh, of our speakers, we've got 30 minutes uh, for you all to make your contributions. So it's over to you. I'll just say this. Please tell us who you are. Uh, uh, remember, too, don't feel you're obliged to ask a question. Don't dress up a statement as a question. If you want to make a statement, if you want to share something in your heart, share it. If you want to ask a question, ask a question. Uh, and uh, the shorter you are, the more others will be able to speak and the more you will hear from the panel. Now, my question is that our farm is very close to Bupe uh, and we, once we are funded, intend to move tens of thousands of uh, tonnages through Bupe to Akasombo and from Akasombo to Atlantic. Now, I just wonder, would this be a possibility of having enough infrastructure uh, connected to the railway and the, and the Akasombo uh, so that we can have uh, a throughput all the way through to uh, Tema, up, uh, Atlantic port. Uh, it lowers our cost by about $10 a ton and we can be more competitive in the international market. So I just wonder whether this facility would enable you to do that, please. The answer to you is that yes. We are going to Akusumbu from, miles, from kilometer 70. We will cross over. We are not going to the other side of the river because it compromises. The original design may compromise uh, the dam because at a certain point it passes 60 kilometers from the hydro dam, which is one of our major sources of power. I have been assured by the contractors that it doesn't compromise. Um, there are no compromises compromise in terms of time of delivery and also no, not much in terms of cost. Because going to the old site would have meant borrowing through 1.3 kilometers of rock. Instead of that, they are now going to go by bridge. So once we finish that, and they hope to finish it by March 2017, they have 400 kilometers, which takes you to Bupe. 420, sorry, sorry, no, they are going to finish by 2020. 2020, thank you. March 2020, which puts you on the water. 400 kilometers, you are Bupe. And um, water, water Lake Company is also making sure that the lake is suitable for the carriage of goods. And that's the shortest way to the north. And your water transportation is cheap. So yes, we'll be there for you. Thank you very much indeed. Can I ask, uh, this is uh, Jensen Tetty, um, Millennium Development Agency. What timeline they have for the process of awarding concession for ECG's assets, operation and investment. Uh, not just the, um, the, the process, but do they have a target date for the concession to be in place? The second question is, is this a model that's going to be rolled out for, GI, for Gridco, its assets and its operation with long-term concession? First of all, let me start with your second question before the first. Um, the compact, the power compact, specifically addresses constraints in the distribution sector at ECG at the end, at the end part of the value chain. You know, we have generation, generation to transmission through Gridco and then Gridco to ECG. ECG distributes to the consumer. The compact funds that we've received will be going specifically into addressing constraints at the distribution end of the chain. Now I'll tell you, I'll share with you what the timeline's looking like. Um, a month ago, we held the first bidders conference. So the five shortlisted bidders visited us in Ghana. We had a conference, we held one-on-one -on -one investor discussions, um, and then we, we um, inspected some of ECG's uh, sites and installations. What we're working at now is preparing the tariff methodology. The tariff methodology to share with the bidders together with the distribution and sales licenses. 
um, we're expecting that um, very quickly we will be able to to share that with the, with, with the shortlisted bidders so that we can receive their proposals by the end of June. Um, sorry, um, uh, submitting their, their final comments by the end of June. That's the end of this week, actually. And then we're moving into August for the final release of the requests for proposal. So August 27th, 2017, we're looking at the final release of the RFP. In September 2017, we expect that there'll be the deadline for the forming of consortium. Um, and then October 2017, we expect the deadline for proposal submissions. We expect to make an announcement in terms of the winning bidder by March 2018, and we're expecting uh, concession commencement in September 2018. 18. That's the timeline we're working to currently. Um, so you just mentioned that one of the key uh, points that uh, the government now is considering the Ministry of Energy is just to uh, guarantee the uh, bankability of the off-takers. Um, how are you planning to provide for that uh, bankability? I know that some projects have a guarantee from the government in order to make it bankable, but I also uh, learned that recently that's not really the policy that uh, wants to be applied, and uh, it's, it's one of the key uh, points to make the, the entire sector bankable. If you look at the direction the government is going in general, private sector driven approach to doing things rather than government centered. So, when it comes to making projects in the energy sector bankable, we're looking at uh, using PCOAs, uh, which is market-driven guarantee, than a government uh, consent and support agreement, um, which uh, creates uh, liabilities, contingent liabilities on government, uh, let me use balance sheet. You know, our debt to GDP ratio is already at a level we want to put under check. So the more government consent support agreement you use to make energy sector projects bankable, the more you create the perception of um, a debt ridden government. So we're doing more PCOAs, that is put call and option agreements, which is market driven uh, approach to uh, hedge the risk of IPP, independent power producers. Thank you. I would say during rush hour, but pretty much any time of the day can be quite painful. Um, there seems to be considerable planning ideas of building towns around, as you were mentioning, around the capital to perhaps spread out the population. But I'm wondering if within your plans within phase two or three, there are plans to provide community, community services mm. to encourage travel, either from all the way from Kumasi into Accra or even just from commuter belt towns to make it easier to get about? First, first of all, the eastern line, the eastern line that comes from Kumasi um, has just about 40 kilometers within Accra and its environs, from Insaom to Accra. Mm. There's a line from Tema to Accra, which is uh, about 20 kilometers. So there's a suburban rail line, which is part of this party project. But there's also another thing we are doing that I didn't put up here. We are trying to do light rail within the three, the two, the, we are looking at three cities, but it looks good for two cities. The numbers that are being put up is good for Accra and Kumasi. And light rail, suburban rail, monorail, and we have about six or seven proposals from various people who have looked at the numbers. So it's a, it, we have to do it. We don't have a choice. I mean, Accra is four hours uh, from anywhere to anywhere. I had a meeting with the mine director of one of our banks, and he said to me that he couldn't do, he found it very difficult to do two meetings in a day outside his office. Uh, my name is Nicholas Oliver. I come from NMS Infrastructure. Uh, we're currently building $175 million worth of hospitals for you uh, in Ghana, and the first one of those have now been handed over. There's been much talk, uh, and this is not railways, I'm afraid. Um, uh, there's been much talk about further social infrastructure uh, to be built uh, in Ghana, particularly health, water, etc. Can I ask, Minister, what the current government's plans are with the IMF? Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. We 
started an IMF program on the 15th of April 2015 for a period of three years, ending April 2018. We came in in January and prepared a budget for March. Now, before we prepared the budget, we had a series of meetings with the fund who came in to look at the benchmarks and the performance under the IMF program. It was woefully, woefully out of target. And the IMF was trying to push all the blame on the government. And I personally told them that they have been very poor supervisors. And that, that idea of trying to blame the government for us to enjoy it, we're not interested. Mm -hmm. Because if you had a deficit target of 3.5, for end year 2016, and you end up on cash basis at 8.7 and on commitment at 10.3, is woefully out of target. And you are coming to Ghana every three months to look at data. So would you tell us that that data has changed within the last three months? <laughs> Their excuse was that data has been hidden from them. We did not quite accept it, but in short, the IMF program is not on target. And you know that when you have a program which is not on target, then there's a problem. So we said, okay, we are going to reduce the deficit in December 2017 to 6.5 from 10.3. They think it was too ambitious that we can't. They believe we can. We're also going to look at growth, which was targeted at 3.5, at 6.5, and it was 3.5. So we said, well, we also want growth to be 6.3 in December. They thought it was too much. We thought we could make it. So as it is, we are all waiting for end December figures, because we have done some projections in this current budget, and we are very optimistic. But I dare say that figures we have received within the last week towards the end of June seems to favor the position of government in terms of budgetary performance. And therefore, if at the end of December, end of December, we are able to meet our targets, we feel quite comfortable. Now, I'll just be hinted. Look, if you decide our budget, our next budget will be November this year. We must announce the budget in Parliament in November this year for 2018. That budget will be supervised by the IMF because then the original program is in force. If they do it, I don't believe that we are going to have any problem. If we get certain targets at this December, we can then begin to talk seriously with the fund. Mm -hmm. We must wait for data to make that decision and negotiation. But whatever it is, Lord, the whole program is about discipline. Mm -hmm. And you don't need the IMF for you to ensure discipline in yourself. With or without the IMF, any serious manager of the economic indicators should be able to do it. You may recall that 2001, we had inflation of 40.5. Mm -hmm. When we took over, I was the Minister of Finance. The fund projected inflation end of our first term to come to 13. We brought it down to 10.1. And they themselves wondered how we did it. We've done it before. We are capable of supervising ourselves to do it right. We believe that we won't have any problem with the fund or with the World Bank. We'll talk along with them, but we want to assure everybody that we are disciplined, we will be disciplined, and we will cooperate with the fund. But we have to wait for data December 2017 to take the discussions after that. Thank you. Thank you. I, must, uh, I must share one thing uh, with you. Uh, I don't think it's a state secret. Uh, but when the Honorable Senior Minister was Minister of Finance in Ghana, 
uh, I was Chief Secretary to the Treasury in the United Kingdom. And there's a sort of club of former uh, finance ministers and chief secretaries. Uh, and uh, it's an open club, uh, you know, you, anyone can join, provided you've been a former <laughs> finance minister or, or, or chief secretary. Uh, but uh, amongst uh, us, there are very few who are held in higher esteem than the honorable senior minister. So, uh, Ghana it will be well served, and the IMF will have uh, a very interesting interlocutor. <laughs> but uh, any more, any more, but any more questions or, or, or points? Brian Sibthorpe from WSP. I wondered if the Deputy Minister could talk a little bit around the projected mix of conventional power plant versus renewables in the future, and whether you had a target in mind for renewable generation penetration. Yeah. Um, at the moment, the current, uh, the, the level of installed capacity is about uh, 4,135 megawatts, and peak demand recorded in March this year was uh, close to 2,200. We project the renewable mix to be about 10 percent. Okay, so if you take 4,000 and 10 percent of it, it goes to a renewable energy space of about 400 megawatts. Thus, we intend to achieve by 2021. So you can look at that space and assess for yourself the investment opportunities in there. But I tell you there are some that are in development. So you have to update yourself with what you can come in for. Be mindful of the tariff. Because we are serious about uh, not doing the slaughterhouse tariff that characterized the previous government, but uh, want to achieve cost effectiveness in power delivery. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think it was really good to hear that you're planning on accelerating the program um, for implementing the master plan. Um, on my reading, I think the master plan by team had 4,000 kilometers being laid over 33 years or so. And I was just wondering whether you're planning on doing less than the 4,000 or the same amount more quickly, just, and, and some idea of the timetable as well, please. Thank you. We are seeking to implement the master plan as much as possible. But in the next four years, we have identified priority projects, which is, you can find in the second phase of the master plan and also part of the third phase. That is 1,400 kilometers. As far as the first, and it's standard gauge new lines. As far as the first phase is concerned, the first phase is rehabilitation of the old lines, which are narrow gauge. The first phase is going to be undertaken mainly by Government of Ghana money. So that is it. And, and we think that the 30 years is the, you know, this money, they told us that when they say it will happen soon in Ghana, it takes us. I think the 30 years force into the to happen soon category. The president says he's in a hurry. So we've cut down the 30 years. If we are going to do one quarter of it within four years, and we continue at that pace, within 15 years we should have finished, or quicker. So four years, 1,400 kilometers. The next four years, at least another 1,400 kilometers. Thank you very much. Regarding the rail project, um, the train stock, is that going to be privately sourced, or is that something that's been factored within the cost? And secondly, to the two gentlemen in the middle, um, regarding onshore oil and gas exploration in Ghana, can we get any sort of update as to where we are with that and what the forward projections are uh, in terms of exploration and development production? Like I mentioned, I said the next 18 months, GMPC's focus is going to be exploration in the Bota Basin. Um, we're very confident that that work will be delivered in 18 months to get, give us a feel of how the, 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 the field looks like, the existence and the scope of hydrocarbons. So once that is done, then we'll move to the next phase, which will be out of our hands. We'll be with the Petroleum Commission and the Minister of Energy as to how these blocks can be 
allocated to interested parties. But one thing is for sure, GMPC itself, this time will be taking some of the blocks. Uh, one thing I failed to mention is the fact that it is our aim to become a technical operator ourselves. Of course, not working as GMPC, but working through a subsidiary. And we'll be inviting collaborator partners. You know, we're looking for small, medium-sized operators, not the big boys, so that we can also manage some of these fields ourselves and thereby give more value to government. I can assure you that in terms of personnel, we do have the finest of all these scientists that you look for. And that shouldn't be a problem at all. So if we get a good collaborator, we should be in business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joe, the rolling stock. The Tema 2, Akosumbu Rail Line, the contract included the rolling stock. It was a loan from the Indian, uh, Indian government backed by Indian Exim. But one of the things we are doing about, um, in this uh, new program is that we are also reviewing the institutional and legal framework. And we tend to, uh, the, the British, this, your model is a good model. We tend to give our concessions to various people to be able to en encourage private operations. So we are willing to talk to people who are willing to do rolling stock. For example, government today is um, doing the Western Line. We started doing the Western Line on it. And we are doing um, Tutakwa, which is kilometer 64. And we are quite willing to talk to rolling stock operators. Ghana Railway Development Authority, whose boss is here today, is responsible for developing, managing, and regulating. We are going to divide them into two. They are going to become very much the infrastructure holder, and they'll give us concessions to people to, um, to operate, manage and make profit. And they are profitable lines, I assure you. Um, I take the opportunity to make two points. One, to state that um, the Ghana National Corporation, the Petroleum Corporation, has always been very supportive of our partners. So that should give you confidence for you to come. We are partners, we represent government interests, we manage government interests, and we've made it possible for our partners to be able to navigate you know, the environment very well, so all difficult situations are resolved without much difficulty. So that gives you a good platform for you to come and partner with us. Secondly, I want to assure our investors that the situation which has happened in other countries, like the classic Delta situation in Nigeria, do apologies to my neighbors, it's not likely to happen in Ghana. The Ghana National Petroleum Corporation is embarked on an initiative in terms of our corporate social responsibility with three main pillars of focus. The first one is to redirect corporate social investments into education and training. And I was glad this morning the issue of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education was emphasized. We are doing a lot of technical skills training thanks to cooperation with our Jubilee partners, TALO, and we intend going on that route. Training more Ghanaians, giving them the right capacity so that we can export even our skills to our friends in East Africa, where they've now found massive amounts of gas. The second pillar will focus on economic empowerment. That's trying to assist those enclaves where we operate, where the people have been affected in one way or the other by operations with some kind of interventions which will help them redeem their livelihoods. And that is very critical to us. Finally, we are not going to ignore the environment. We are very green in nature. And we are encouraging all our partners not to just leave their corporate social responsibility to philanthropism in terms of social amenities provision, but be very alive to 
reclaiming the environment. With these three pillars, we believe if we implement them very well, will help avert the dangers of the communities rising against the installations that we have. We think that is the right way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Honorable Kojo. Thank you. I will restrict my comment to the overhyped political risk which um, has characterized Ghana and for that matter other African countries. Isolate Ghana from the larger political risk. And I say this with emphasis because um, I've seen and read companies that took their risk and came to Ghana some over 100 years ago and are still making money. Barclays, between 1914 and 1918, when there was World War, we all know, Barclays on 14th February, on a Valentine Day, was commissioning, commissioning Barclays in Ghana when the world was fighting. Today, they celebrate 100 years of investment in Ghana. I also tell you, in 18, you said railway started in 1898, 1896, 98. In 1896, Stanchat entered Ghana. Today, they are there, still making money. I draw attention to a recent development when senior minister was uh, the finance minister in 2001. Money transfer. The world was seeing Africa as a risk destination in money transfer businesses. And Western Union gave a franchise to a Ghanaian. Within a short time, the country's money transfer inflows from outside jumped from a less than $200 million a year to $1.5 billion within three years space. That is there. Small investor going into a country staying focused over a period of time. A recent record, a company that came, I know at that time a capital of about $200,000 starting mobile telephony services called Space Phone Den was valued after about 10 years and franchise changed from Space Phone to Ariba, and the value was $4 billion US dollars. That is how much money mm -hmm. those investors made. History is in the making. Tallinn, in recent year, you know it's one of the brand sponsors. Um, if we do corporate references, and you are to ask the brands, global brands that are operating in Ghana, they will share their true stories about that investment destination with you. In the energy sector, the energy ministry, we are positioning ourselves to give you energy security so that everything you want to do over the technological space, you will get it right and make money. Just note that the difference between developing country and developed country, that gap, it's money to be made by investors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, this is an exciting time to invest in Ghana. We have a new government, uh, government in a hurry, government that believes in the rule of law, promotes investment and business. And I think the most exciting sector to invest in is the railway sector. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if you think only about this sector as a real network, then you've made a big mistake. We think about it as a total economic investment package, which includes a real network, and also includes all the economic activity that takes place along the real corridor. Fiber optics, carrying fiber optics along the real corridor is, uh, is, is a major investment from housing to even the stations. I mean, we have the advantages of having sunshine all year round. And if Victoria Station, even with the cold weather, is a viable option, a viable economic option, how about our major stations in Accra and in Kumasi? We are going to create inland ports. We are, we, we are going to transform this economy. The country is going to be transformed on the backbone of the railway. And I invite you to join us. So I want the history of the transformation of Ghana is being written. Your name will be part of it. Thank the audience for their attention. 
I thank the organizers for inviting me to tell the story of the railway. Thank you very much. All right. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I think we must be very grateful to UK Ghana Trade and Investment Group for making today possible. So all those, Tony and co, who put this together, we must give them a big clap. <laughs> there is a new government in Ghana, barely six months old. That new government came in with a mission, won a massive election, and is prepared to fulfill its mandate of creating jobs for its people. One of our biggest problems is unemployment. And we believe we have promised the people to find jobs for the teeming youth. And that's what we are going about in this room. I was happy with the last speaker because we should not be talking about only big investors to create jobs. SMEs all over are the main source of creating jobs. Bangladesh is the biggest exporter of jute bags. The bags are made by individual farmers, looms. They are centrally purchased like the Goko Marketing Board and delivered on behalf of these individual farmers. And it works. It is important for all of us in this room, depending on the skills we have, the capital we have, to assist Ghana create jobs create development, we on our part will want to make Ghana the most friendly environment for the private sector. We are determined to do that and we are working in that direction. We also know that corruption is a problem in our country and the new government is prepared to solve corruption past and present. We are going to make sure that we treat ourselves fairly as a country and as a people by saying no to corruption. I would want to say, Lord, that we are very grateful for people whose time is so expensive find the time to come and assist chair sessions of this nature. We are here for a couple of days. We'll be talking among ourselves and with the various captains of industry. Our soon, which used to be for too long, has changed. Our soon today is soon. So please, don't worry about what is happening. On behalf of the Ghana delegation, and on my own personal behalf, I want to say a very big thank you for the time you have found to help Ghana discover partners for business, to promote business, create employment, and to push Ghana ahead on the development ladder. Thank you very much, distinguished panelists, for this beautiful show you have put up this afternoon. We are exploring, as I said, we came from China a couple of nights ago will continue to move to Germany and other countries to attract investment to our country. Looking at the room, we have enough businessmen to do some business in Ghana. Please do come and we'll give you the support to make money for yourself and for our country. Thank you very much.